tomorrow, opening statements will begin as we enter week two of Donald Trump's 2016 election interference trial. Judge Mershon is also expected to rule on what the prosecution can ask Trump if he takes the stand. And Tuesday, a hearing is scheduled to assess Trump's potential violations of the judge's gag order. Joining us now is former FBI general counsel Andrew Weissman. He's the former senior member of the Mueller probe and a professor at the New York University School of Law. Also, MSNBC legal analyst Mary McCord. She's the former principal deputy assistant attorney general for the National Security Division. Andrew and Mary co-host the Prosecuting Donald Trump podcast, and they prosecute. Ooh. Trust me. They're good. <laughs> they got <laughs> they're good. The, They have it down. <laughs> they're I, good. I have not checked out the latest episode, even though you are in my downloaded podcast that they pushed to me. <laughs> Did you all already discuss um, Monday on the podcast, or have you yet to record that episode? We did discuss uh, okay. what we did. We had this is a very cool episode. We had Robert De Niro and Glenn Close reading parts of the statement of facts mm. that that were um, produced along with the indictment a year ago by Alvin Bragg, and then we broke it down and analyzed what we expected the trial to reveal to prove up those facts in the statement of facts. So okay. I think it's a nice preview of what we're going to start hearing next week. These two are hanging out with so many celebrities. They're going to stop waking up early on Saturday and Sunday morning. Morning to I hang know, out with the, the three I was of like, us. Glenn Close. Glenn Close. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay. So t tomorrow, I, I understand these are opening statements, not opening arguments. What's the difference? Uh, you know, from the defense point of view, very little. Um, you will you will hear a lot of argument. Um, they may couch it in terms of statements. I, if I were one of your viewers, I wouldn't get hung up on that. What I anticipate is a huge tug of war over. Michael Cohen and who's essentially whose is he? Who sort of mm. he's going to have so many sort of he has so much baggage and he has so much in terms of bad acts, but he also has evidence. Um, and you're going to hear, I think, the defense saying, you know, this is the heart and soul, the critical key witness of the case, and he's a liar. I mean, you're going to hear that over and over again from the defense, and they're going to be like, he's their witness. The, the, the state's witness, and he's critical to the case. I think from the state, you're going to be say, hearing he's not the critical witness. There's tons of documents. There are tons of other witnesses. And with respect to Michael Cohen, who, who, why is he here? He's here because of that man, um, because of Donald Trump. So there's going to be a bit of tug of war on him, I'm for sure. Um, but I think from the state's case, you're going to really be hearing about like the sort of idea in the media that he's sort of the star witness is going to be a misnomer. I think that's going to be their mm. position. Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting point, Andrew, that, you know, you, you've got the drama around, you know, the witnesses, you know, both Stormy and, and Michael, uh, and what that looks like and how that plays out. But what I also find even more dramatic and, and certainly more important to how this thing, this trial is ultimately going to go, it's the jury itself. Um, and you have uh, Danny Savalas, uh, who reported um, regarding Trump's behavior, noting uh, Trump has built a reputation as a showman. He's an outsized presence, physically and rhetorically. Performance art, especially cocky or aggressive behavior, serves Trump well at his rallies and in front of the camera. But in my experience, juries don't usually appreciate it. Mary, I think that's important. I mean, Kent, is it possible that Trump loses the jury before the trial effectively begins? I think we saw that in the E. Jean Carroll trial, and I think we saw that in the civil fraud trial, that his behavior in court, um, you know, was didn't reflect well on him. It didn't reflect well on him being subject to the rule of law and the process that all other Americans are, are subject to when mm -hmm. they're involved in litigation. And I think, you know, the jurors, they are they are making impressions about the defendant from Day one, and day one was last week when they right. were selected, right? right? They're watching his demeanor while he's sitting there at the table. They're watching how he responds to the witnesses on the stand, right? Is he rolling his eyes? Is he muttering? And we know from the previous trials that sometimes he mutters loudly, and I think with the intent for the jury to hear it, but the jury's not necessarily going to take that well, right? It looks like somebody who can't sit still, who can't obey things. And of course, if he falls asleep, that doesn't look good to the jury either. Yeah. Mm. 
Mm, yeah. yes. Sleeping at the table never works. Are they allowed to take notes in this trial? I, in, mo in many trials, they are, but that's always up to the to the judge and up to whatever the rules of this court are. And I actually, since Manhattan is not a place where I practice, I'm not sure what Judge Mershon's rules are. I had judges in D.C., both the local court and the federal court, some that would allow it and some that would not. The problem with taking notes is that when you get back in the jury room to deliberate, people will often feel like their notes are proof of that they got it right, but you can easily make a mistake in your notes. And so that's one reason that sometimes um, the parties will urge a court, even if it's permissible, not to allow note taking. I, I do think that uh, along the lines of this, Andrew made a really, uh, I think, Im important note here. Mary, I've heard you say this. Y'all have been all over the airs talking about this, that it is not just Michael Cohen. I went back and I read the, the, the statement of facts and the indictment that happened over a year ago. And David Pecker's non-prosecution agreement with um, uh, the Manhattan DA's office, I, I think it's critical here. And we will perhaps hear a lot more about David Pecker. And do you think, Andrew, maybe even from David Pecker himself throughout the course of this trial? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be surprised if he is not a witness here. And I totally agree with you that he is going to be, if there's a, a central witness, um, he is going to be a very, very important narrator. Uh, remember, he, according to the charges in the statement of facts that uh, Mary referenced, um, he's in, a, in this scheme from day one. Um, and the scheme is hideous, according to the DA. I mean, this is Donald Trump in, engaged in sort of ground zero of fake news, where he is working with the National Enquirer, not just to catch and kill, to you know kill bad stories about himself, but also to disseminate, according to the DA, false information about his adversaries with the complicity of a media outlet. And we may all not think the National Enquirer is sort of particularly Tony or highbrow, but it's still a media outlet with a vast reach that, according to the DA, was working with a political campaign. And it may all seem sort of, we may be inured to this in light of the Dominion and Fox suit, but I think we're going to sort of have that sort of rubbed in our faces and, you know, under our nose to sort of force us to think about what is going on when you have a political candidate um, being helped by a media outlet who should be dispassionate and trying to be fair and balanced. And I think you're going to see the exact opposite um, when David Pecker testifies about what the scheme was. Mary, I'm just so struck by the fact that we were being prepared for the fact that jury selection was going to take two weeks. You had Michael Cohen saying it was likely to take three weeks. Here we are. It has only taken a week. The, the pace of this trial, and I think we are all worried about the sanctity of this jury, especially given that we're talking about Donald Trump, especially what we've seen um, from right-wing media figures. Um, you have this from Politico on Thursday. Prosecutors saying Trump has violated his gag order seven more times. They previously asked the judge to hold the former president in contempt. It feels this week like the stakes got higher, right? Because these are, these are no longer random folks. These are now 12 people with real lives, with, with real families who are acting in the service of this country, right, and in the service of their state. And we got a, a preview this week of how those tactics can be used to intimidate and, and to undermine. And I just I, I wonder what the lesson is moving into week two. So, you know, jury service is a, is a major burden and a civic obligation, regardless of what trial you sit on, but particularly when you are sitting on the first ever trial of a former president. And I think, you know, what we saw last week, uh, the second day of jury selection, or I guess the day after the first jurors had been selected, one of the jurors got cold feet because she realized the information that had been put out publicly about her allowed her to be identified. And and after that, Judge Mershon smartly did what I think he should have done before he, the process ever started. He's, he restricted uh, the news organizations who have been in there following jury selection, restricted them from putting out so much identifying information, including form your current employer, your previous employer, and descriptions of your appearance, right? Because in this case, the stakes are even higher for the reasons you said. We have a defendant here who has gone after witnesses and potential witnesses in not only this trial, but previous trials. He's gone after judges. He's gone after this judge's family members, this judge's daughter. He's gone after prosecutors, et cetera. And so, and he did make comments, and you indicated this, that have caused the DA 
to, again, on multiple grounds, seek uh, uh, the judge to hold Mr. Trump in contempt for violating the gag order because of it, some of his comments were directed to jurors. And so we really are asking a lot of, uh, of our citizens. And I think in one way for that reason, I'm glad that Judge Mershon seems to be really, really running a tight ship and making things move. He is not taking any, you know, delay tactics. He is, you know, I, we were surprised about this all happening in one week. And I think that's largely to his credit. He is not going to be sidetracked. And hopefully we can get the, the evidence presented in a timely fashion. Hopefully both the DA will be concise with what it presents and that the judge will, will not allow cross-examination that, you know, really goes too long and is too far afield. And he will keep this moving for all of our sakes, including the sakes of the jurors. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.